Welcome, welcome, welcome to another of our Wednesday Yachting Lunches live from the St. Francis Yacht Club. Wonderful to see everybody here today. Gives me great pleasure right off the bat to introduce our Commodore for 2019, Paul Heineken. Commodore Heineken. Thanks, Ron. Uh, I think you're going to get tired of seeing me uh, as I've been called into duty again today. Uh, but thank you very much for being here. Ron runs a great program, and I actually am really eager to share with you all the foundation, uh, what the St. Francis Sailing Foundation has done and will continue to do. So thanks, Ron, and thanks for all being here. Welcome. Thank you, Commodore. So as you're about to learn, our speaker today, uh, Bill Chrysler, is not going to be present. We're going to talk to him over the telephone. He's here in my iPhone. We'll have, we have a mic to it. He's in Southern California, caught at business every now and then. I hate it when business interrupts our sailing careers. Bill has one such interruption right now. You're saying, Bill Chrysler, wait a second, Bill Chrysler, he's the president of the foundation. What did he do before that? Well, at age four, that's when it all started for Bill. His father um, put him in a sabbat at Southwestern YC down in San Diego and shoved him away from the dock. That's a good way to start a sailor. Bill sailed across the channel thinking, oh my God, this is fantastic. I can sail. And he kept that incredible level of confidence until he smashed into the Commodore's powerboat. Took Bill years, he claims, to recover from that, but he ultimately did, and he knew so when at age 16, Don Trask asked him, at age 16 and 175 pounds, Don Trask asked him to fly to Cleveland to race in the Star North Americans, which they won. So holy cow, he's 16 years old, he's the winning crew in you know the Star North Americans. Now he really knew that he knew how to sail. So at age 21, he came to the sailing mecca for America, San Francisco Bay, and started sailing here, still on stars and occasionally on Don's father's Fairlong Clipper that I raced against back in those days out here as well. And uh, he basically started making lasers in 72. From 72 to 80, he made guess how many lasers? Somebody want to guess? Big prize here. You get my salary as a prize. So what? How many did he make? Somebody said eight hundred. Fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand lasers. Probably twenty-five percent of all their production. Twenty percent of all their production of lasers in those days were made right up here in San Rafael. He then got back to sailing in the 80s, sailed around in canars and in team racing and things like that. And around 2012, he was asked to join the foundation. In 2017, became the president of the foundation. And so I've got a few questions for Bill. We're going to have Bill ask a few questions, and then Commodore Heineken is going to give us a slideshow about the foundation. And then we have another treat. We have a present in the room, a board member from the foundation, Mo Roddy. Wave us, give us a hand wave, Mo. And we have past uh, five-term, five-year president of the foundation, Carolyn Patrick. Pat Carolyn, we're looking forward to getting your comments in just a little bit. Um, so, Bill, first question I have is, what percent of your billable time do you spend on f foundation matters? <laughs> I wish I got paid by the hour, Ron. I, uh... Well, we're doubling your salary as of this announcement. <laughs> Not as much as I'd like to, and not as much as probably I should, as witnessed by this little uh, incident today, which I'd like to take this chance to apologize to everybody for. I uh, I was on my way to the airport last night. I got a call from my client demanding that I stay overnight for a critical meeting today, which I, of course, did, thinking, you know, I thought when I started my own business, I thought I'd get to be my own boss, which... That was 35 years ago, and so far, um, that's not working out too good. <laughs> but here I am, and I'll do the best I can. And thank, thank you to Paul and Carolyn for standing in the wings and helping, helping make this thing work. What's and the, you, and you, Ron, too. What's the What's the most enjoyable single moment you've had in your two years of tenure as president of the foundation, Bill? Oh, gosh, there's been a lot. I mean, it, it was a real privilege to get to be on the board when Carolyn was steering the ship 
And during her tenure, uh, there was all kinds of exciting developments, one of which was, of course, the, the, the um, Tom Allen contribution, which kind of changed the whole nature of the foundation. It made us, uh, in some ways, take things a lot more seriously, and others opened the door for new opportunities. So that was certainly a big deal. Um, and then I think the, the, the events just immediately preceding this, uh, this decision to try to make a big difference in the sport, um, which is kind of what we're talking about today, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I was going to ask uh, a funny moment since you've been president, but we might be living it. Uh, give us a, <laughs> I'm afraid that's true. Yeah. Aside from this one, give us a funny moment since you took the reins. Oh gosh, a funny moment. It's been all, it's, I, you know, I, I, that's, I wish I would have had time to prepare because I'm sure I could have thought of a funny moment, but it's been, <laughs> it's it's a been living one. fun and exciting and rewarding, but I, I don't think the word funny falls into, into line anywhere in particular. Okay. Um, Give us some metrics. What's the uh, total number, uh, the size of the foundation at this point? Well, we're getting somewhere in the neighborhood of $5 million in terms of, of, of uh, corpus, but, but much of that is restricted. And actually, the PowerPoint that Paul is going to present gets much more detailed into the um, into where we are and what we're trying to accomplish in terms of what we do do on a routine basis. Um, so the, the, but the thing that I was hoping to sort of talk about is the events that led up to the, the, the decision to try to put together this fast program that we're doing over on Treasure Island. So we'll get to hear about that from Paul. Let me ask, are there other foundations you admire, whose work you admire? Well, there are lots of foundations I admire. Um, there are, I think, other, many other foundations in the sport of sailing but most of them are relatively small and focused very, you know, in a fairly narrow focus. I think the thing that's exciting about the St. Francis Foundation, St. Francis Sailing Foundation, is that we have a pretty broad um, net we cast. And we've been privileged enough to be a part of a bunch of different things. And I think one of the things that's most exciting is our track record in terms of picking young sailors who show promise. I think that's very much a part of why people are on the foundation. We we get a lot, we have a lot of people on the board that really know the sport really well, and therefore can pick out people that are on their way up and we can help them out a little bit. And as a result, I think if you did a study on, you know, foundations and who picks the winners the most number of times, I think you'd find that the St. Francis Salient Foundation comes out on top. How many Olympians did St. Francis have in Rio? Oh, well, in Rio, now that's a whole new problem. I know, One, just to get... And we didn't have any the year, the, the cycle before. So mm -hmm. the whole sport of sailing in the U.S. at an Olympic level is in a state of, you know, it's pretty discouraging. And mm -hmm. that's the whole purpose behind what we're trying to do at mm -hmm. Treasure Island. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Terrific. So last question, how often, now that you're immersed in the foundation, the sailing foundation, how often do you get to go sailing? <laughs> Not very often. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pretty rare. Like, like, give me a metric, like once a quarter, once a year? Oh, I, yeah, I mean, I'd be lucky if I get out on the water a couple of times a quarter, half a dozen at the most. Okay. Yeah, although I have to say, I've just uh, I bought Russ Silvestri's old fin a few years ago, and I've uh, I've decided to resurrect it. There's a pretty active fin fleet in San Diego, and so my boat's at a shop in L.A. getting sort of rebuilt and reconditioned, and I may actually get some time sailing my fin. The problem with me sailing is that my schedule's so difficult that getting a crew together and then showing up on time as witnessed by this event today, uh, is kind of unpredictable. So I'm, I'm lucky to be, have a job I love doing, but it's uh, all consuming sometimes, I'm afraid. 
Great. Well, thanks for giving us this time. We knew we had this short window with you, and uh, good luck in the gig down there. Uh, Bill, I'm now going to talk about future programs and then have our commenter come up and use the deck that you put together. Thank you so much for being president of the foundation. Thank yeah, you very much, my, Bill my Chrysler. Pleasure. Thank you for coming. You, thanks, buddy. Bye. A little bit about future speakers. Um, so... Luke Miller, speaking of members of the U.S. Olympic team, he'll be here on June 12th to talk all about his effort. He recently got a good-sized chunk of money, maybe half of his fundraising goal just happened a, a week and a half ago, which is wonderful. Um, and then uh, on in May, we'll hear from Channing Robertson, who is uh, he's chairman emeritus of the Stanford Engineering School, quite a prestigious role. He'll be talking about biomimetic design, that is to say, what nature can teach us about speed. Uh, we'll he'll hear from uh, Patrick Hunt, the renowned Stanford historian about the technical uh, naval tactical surprises of Hannibal and the beginnings of biological warfare. Um, we'll do a roast of of uh, Terry Klaus on March in March. Dewey Hines will come by in March to talk about St. Francis in the 50s. Aron Young, spelled differently, Y-E-U-N-G, an incredibly more prestigious. He's a distinguished professor of hydrodynamics uh, from Berkeley. We'll be here to talk all about giant, giant uh, wave um, ocean wave injured uh, technology. Caleb Payne, the only medalist from America at the Rio Olympics, will be here also in March to talk about with the bronze medal on the mantle, it's time to go for the gold. He's got an all-out campaign to go for the gold. And next week, uh, Bill Wells will be here. He's the executive director of the California Delta Chamber of Commerce, and he'll be here to talk to us about a history of yachting in the Delta. So we have great uh, speakers coming up. And now, um, having said thank you to Bill for being president of the foundation, we're next going to hear from our Commodore, who joined the board of the foundation in 07, and um, uh, can tell us all about the board and use the deck that Bill has prepared. And then we'll have a Q&A with our past president of the foundation, Carolyn Patrick and Paul Heineken. So welcome up our Commodore, Paul Heineken. Paul. This one work okay? This seems to work. Okay. Um, well, as, as I am a stand-in here, uh, I, would, I have a lot of information about the foundation that I'd like to uh, share with you, but I also want to apologize in advance if it bounces around a little bit uh, because uh, I think there's some important historical points here um, that need to be brought out. And following Bill's introduction, I have to tell you how I met Bill because I was a young medical resident here when I came out in 75, dragging my old wooden fin across country. And uh, my friends here, uh, like Carl Van Dyne, who'd just been to the Olympics, said, uh, uh, oh, everybody's sailing lasers now. So go to San Rafael, uh, call his friend Don Trask, and uh, he'll set you up with a factory second, which all the local, all the local guys got. So I did. I drove up, and he said, what color do you want? And I said, well, orange. I just got out of Princeton. And uh, I said, okay, here's an orange one. Uh, I think we can call this a factory second. So you can take this for $600, I think. And uh, so 26619 was my first laser uh, out here. So that was uh, how I first met uh, Bill. And then, of course, he was narrating the laser slalom and doing all sorts of, sorts of fun stuff out here. Um, so uh, I, I did want to go back to the very beginning because it's listed on the on the website because I joined the foundation in 2007, but it has a long history before that. And we have a number of the founders here. Uh, uh, Bill Leroy, who actually is our... Uh, Carolyn, what's his official title? Uh, founder and President Emeritus. Founder and President Emeritus, Bill Leroy. Thank you. And then we also have Pax Davis, who, uh, what, 16 years as president of the foundation, Pax? And then, yes. 
And then uh, we're mentioning the other uh, board members we have in here. And we, of course, uh, could not leave out Grant, who's been on every board forever. So Grant, thank you very much. So that's uh, the, the prior background, but I, I want to read this because it says it all. The founders were Pax Davis, Bill Haler, who is still our Secretary Treasurer, Bill Leroy, Jim Kennedy, and Tom Allen. Past presidents include Pax Davis, Bill, Jim Casino, Bob Billingham, and Carolyn. Uh, the foundation accomplishes its fundraising goals through individual contributions and an annual auction event. Its grant giving recipients have included Olympic sailors, junior sailors, community outreach programs, handicapped sailors, and regattas. Uh, that, um, that is all true and kind of understated. So I'll go in, into it in a little bit more detail when we also get to the deck. Uh, my history with the foundation uh, was I was running the junior program here, and 12 years ago, uh, it w basically uh, Commodore Lotto said, let's see what the foundation can do to help our junior sailors locally uh, more. And so we integrated with lots more local yacht club people, and I was trying to be on both organizations for quite some time there. Then I became the grants chair, and, and Tom Allen, from Tom Allen, and Tom had been doing this by himself for years and years. He'd get all these grant requests from kids that wanted to go to regattas around the country and around the world and try to figure out their budget and, 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 and help them out to go. And actually, my kids were recipients of, of, of you know, they were benefactors of uh, the foundation when they were early in their 49er and kiting career, and it helped them travel. But... But Tom would try to do it individually, and we got bigger, and it got more challenging. And so we actually came up with guidelines that we could use for kids at what level they were sailing and how far they were traveling so that we could have a more consistent way of, of providing funds to them. And uh, uh, that has gone on when I had to step down because of being a flag officer. Mo Roddy took over with Grant's chair, and we have some really good people on that committee who are really in touch with young sailors. You know, like Mike Manager, Mike Martin, Molly Carapier, uh, Pam Healy, et cetera, all are very much in touch with the, the sailing that's going on around the bay for the individual grants component. And uh, I'm probably getting ahead of myself and should go to the deck a little bit, and that'll explain it. Um, and, and so here we have the first slide. Uh, Daniela. Uh, what a, what a talented woman this is. Uh, Three-time world champion, and she's now 18 years old. And maybe she'll get the Rolex again uh, next month. We'll see. But uh, she said she couldn't have done it without the foundation, and uh, that's absolutely true. The, um, this is not... I was trying to advance, and it didn't go wrong. That's, let's go back one. Yeah. So this is, uh, uh, again, our, our mission statement, and I kind of went through this already. But I think uh, without over overdwelling on the history, the, the, when I joined in 2007, I was actually joining the foundation, which was also part of an, an Olympic support committee. And that was uh, created by Bill and Packy and company to help uh, prospective Olympians and was very, very active. And, and I'm trying to remember which year. We had a big party here before everybody went off to Beijing. And every Olympian came through this club, and we were we, this foundation had supported half of them along their uh, their Olympic quest. So that was really exciting. And since then, every Olympic uh, year, we've had about half of the team have been our grantees. So we have put the West Coast and uh, and uh, our in impact on Olympic sailing very much in front of the the United States and U.S. sailing, and that will come, I'll come back to later when we get into the FAST program. So 
Uh, here's uh, 2017 financials. So this is what the Grants Committee and the Foundation has, has done. Uh, on the way, bringing money in, we brought in $159,000 net in the auction. And that is in a few weeks, March 12th, right, Carolyn? Uh, Tuesday night. Please sign up. Please sign up as a patron or sponsor, and you'll see what good things happens with your largesse. We get some other donations. And because, oh, I left out the business uh, of Tom Allen. And, and that's, that's just not fair. Tom uh, was a giant in Bay Area sailing. And he was one of the founders of the foundation. And uh, he was the head of the Grants Committee all those years. When I was negotiating with him for what the club and the club juniors could get, and Tom and I and John Collins had some very interesting discussions. And then he said to me one day, uh, you know, you really need to take this over. I'm getting kind of tired. And I said, Tom, uh, nobody can do what you're doing, but I'll do my best. Uh, please make a flash drive of everything you have in paper, in shoe boxes full of paper at home, so I can get caught up. And he did. He provided me the flash drive. And about two or three weeks later, he had a heart attack and died. And uh, boy, would I have been lost without that flash drive. Uh, it was all of Tom's history there at the foundation. And then uh, a few weeks later, we find out that he left a large part of, of his legacy to the foundation, divided equally between this foundation and Treasure Island, where he was also on the board and a founder. So uh, that's how the foundation got some of its um, corpus behind it. Uh, then later we learned that uh, a few years later, the foundation and Treasure Island equally again would be benefactors to a follow-up part of, of his legacy. So that is really how the foundation got its, its corpus. Now many in the club and around say, well, yes, thank you, Tom. <laughs> say, why haven't you spent it all? And uh, because we're smarter than that. Uh, because this is going to really develop uh, sailing in the bay uh, for a long time into the future. And so it is restricted money. We do get to spend some of the income from it every year. And, uh, uh, but when those good things happened, the foundation decided, what do we want to be when we grow up, really? Now that we are an adult, do we want to just live on our laurels and just uh, give away the income of the, of the endowment every year? Or do we want to really try to impact sailing in the country and around the world? So we did that. We had a, a long retreat and uh, decided we can, we can do more. And, and because of where we are and because we'd kind of been ignored by East Coast sailors and U.S. sailing over the year, and yet we knew we had the best conditions for training uh, for nine months of the year, let them go to Miami every winter time, but the rest of the time it's better here. Uh, we started um, basically courting U.S. sailing after the last Olympics and our new Olympic coach, Malcolm, Malcolm Page, to come out and uh, make an Olympic training site here. And the obvious location was Treasure Island because it's right in the middle of the bay and you can have every condition that you would want to train for around the world in the Olympics within a few miles of Treasure Island. And we have this um, facility in Treasure Island Sailing uh, Center that's excellent for it but just needs to be developed. And so that's uh, we recruited Malcolm Page and a whole bunch of U.S. sailing uh, leadership and we have developed this FAST program, uh, Facility for Advanced Sailing and Technology, trying to bring in the um, uh, high-tech Bay Area community to the sailing community and get them together. And Bill Chrysler was instrumental here in arranging a relationship with Autodesk so that Autodesk can work directly with our US sailing uh, uh, technology people and the entire U.S. Olympic technology group 
is now going to be centered out here uh, to to uh, uh, basically improve our Olympic performance using Bay Area technological uh, uh, expertise. So, so this all started coming together about a year ago, and then we're entering the era of San Francisco politics of how does Treasure Island get its long-term lease so it's there, and how do we, I, I forgot to mention that when uh, Oracle took apart its Bermuda station, it had a, a, a compound of containers uh, that they needed to unload, and they unloaded them to us, uh, and they were shipped across uh, from Bermuda all the way here. They're sitting down in an Oakland terminal uh, that Doug Smith all arranged, and I, I didn't give credit to, to Doug Smith and the America One uh, group, which is also very important in helping develop FAST. So it was, a, it was uh, those two organizations, uh, the, the foundation giving some seed money, uh, the America One team having already given U.S. Sailing a bunch of money for, for the development program, and, uh, and uh, coming together with leadership by Peter Stoneberg, uh, Bill Chrysler, and Carolyn uh, to get fast going. So I told you I was going to bounce around, and I just did. But, but that's, that's where we are. So now I'll try to go back to the slides here. Uh, so that explains, I think I got as far as where the money comes from, and now I'll go over here to where it goes to. So the St. Francis Junior Program, uh, uh, again, our donors are largely St. Francis Yacht Club members, and they want to see their donations go to our kids as much as possible, as well as other very important missions of the club. I mentioned the, um, uh, so the juniors and the grants to individuals, uh, those two columns of $130,000, they're largely are, are to our local kids. Some of those Olympians come out and they actually join the club so that uh, they are our kids as well, uh, but they may have started somewhere else in the country. And Paige Riley is an example of that. She's a two-time Olympian, so close to a medal a couple times, and she's going at it for a third time, and she'll be out here giving a yachtsman's lunch uh, next week, right, Ron? February 6th. Yeah, next week. So Paige is an example uh, of we recruit great athletes and we support great athletes and they come back and help support the club and they will and Paige will be doing some clinics for our juniors. The community outreach uh, component, the yacht club under its lease is required to do community outreach for young sailors, and uh, we can do a certain amount here at the club, but because of our conditions, it's not ideal. And uh, Treasure Island is ideal. And during the America's Cup here, the uh, Oracle team committed to starting this program called Set Sail Learn, which is for fourth graders to come out and do a day of STEM education at Treasure Island. About 1,500 kids come through that program now every year. One of the most successful programs uh, that San Francisco Schools runs and that program uh, was just dropped when Oracle left and went to Bermuda. So it, uh, it was just going to totally founder, uh, but then the foundation stepped up and said, this is something that could be uh, something that the foundation could support. It could put its name on. It could put the St. Francis name on. And the city fathers would appreciate it. And we would be doing something good for, for our community. Uh, there, we also help support some small outreach programs over in uh, the new Alameda Community Sailing Center and, and in Richmond. So that's where that money is going. And then as I, it says, shows here the $57,000 for fast expenditures, which was just to help get uh, permits and get the, get the uh, containers out here and all last year. So we're putting in that seed money we want. U.S. Sailing also is not loaded with money right now, so we're trying to work with them to, uh, to really build this program. Uh, this is just some of the member grantees. Uh, and just 
this is all based on guidelines now, and when we have someone who's got an ongoing Olympic campaign and no job, we, we basically commit to them to up to $3,000 a month. Uh, that isn't a lot considering their costs of travel, uh, but that's why Caleb Payne, uh, who uh, you know, is up at that 11.5 number, and I should give another plug to Bill. Um, Caleb would never, ever have gotten that Olympic medal without, without Bill's support. Bill Chrysler, uh, you know, wrote the checks when he needed them to get them going, to get his equipment going, et cetera. Absolutely. And then Luke Muller is the new kid who's stepping up behind him. And actually, Luke Muller's sister is a principal with uh, U.S. Sailing and Fast. And Luke's just down the road at Stanford, uh, at least part-time. I'm not sure because he's sailing a lot. Uh, Awesome. And almost more importantly, the ca he was skippering the Stanford boat in the big sail. And, and my, my Cal kids had to do everything possible wrong to lose to him. <laughs> and somehow they did. Somebody had to do it. Had to do it. Oh, tragedy. The only way you can lose with a penalty on the other team is to be over early, and my kids were in a match race, in an ebb tide. Okay, so that's that. Um, and then here's some quotes that basically are what the kids said, you know, and the, the long and short of it is, we'd have never gotten there without the foundation. You know, that's true, and it's even true for my kids. They were able to uh, do some of their travels in their early kite days, and... Uh, uh, because of that. Okay, what you see is evidence of the most important thing that could happen in Olympic sailing in America, a cultural shift, and it's being led by the San Francisco Bay Area. That's fast. And I have just been waved at by Ron to say to hurry it on up. And uh, wow, thank you. Wonderful. You're just joining us online. Our speakers today are Paul Heineken, Commodore of the St. Francis Yacht Club and decade-long board member of the St. Francis Sailing Foundation and immediate past president, Carolyn Patrick, who served five very successful terms as president of the St. Francis Sailing Foundation. And um, welcome, of course, to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from our beautiful San Francisco. So uh, every year we benefit the most in the, uh, from the foundation with the auction. So we should proudly announce who are the names of the, of the chairs this year who do all the incredible hard work of the auction that's coming up in, in March. Yes, important date, put it on your calendar. March 12th, it's always on a Tuesday. This is very exciting for us because it's our 15th annual auction. So we're... We're here to stay, and we're very excited about that. And our honorary chairs this year are Matt Brooks and his wife, Pam Rourke-Levy. Uh, they're yes. doing a fabulous job. And they have uh, donated some really exciting auction items. And uh, so it's, it, we're pretty excited about it. And uh, our worker, workers uh, who are auction chairs are Michelle Slade and Michelle Harris. So uh, we're working on this, and we're really excited about it. Uh, our fabulous chair of the San Francisco Yacht Club Board of Directors, Paul Kayard, will be our auctioneer this year, and we remember how awesome he was last year. And Jim Casino will also be the MC again this year. So it should be a really fun evening with some cool auction items that money can't buy. So everybody here and others in the Yacht Club community can help with the auction by contributing really great items. Uh, that's the key to the auction, putting great items in that attract uh, people contributions. Uh, and I'm going to keep asking questions, but if you have a question, hold your hand up. Mark Lambros, 
great main sheet trimmer, premier main sheet trimmer. He'll uh, bring a mic to you if you have a question. And I think one thing I should point out is that uh, tickets are on sale now and the early bird pricing ends in three days. So now's a really great time to go to the St. Francis Sailing Foundation website and buy your tickets. And there's also opportunities if you want to buy patron tickets at the $1,500 levels. But just the regular tickets, they're a bargain right now, going up in three days. Uh, question, Carolyn, you were president for five years. What was the most proud moment uh, in your five years term as president? There were many, but uh, two, I'll go two directions. One was in the, uh, our most recent Olympics down in Rio, where fully 50% of the U.S. team were grantees from the St. Francis Sailing Foundation. And the only that medalist... That is just an amazing yeah. statistic. That is one... If there was a college that had 50% of the finalists at the NCAA championship from one college, you'd say, what a college. That is yes. our yacht club. And our only medalist uh, in Rio in was uh, Caleb Payne. For the whole United States was Caleb Payne, our grantee. And back four years before that, one of the only two, one of the two medalists was Zach Rayleigh, also uh, from our foundation. And so then the flip side of my proudest moment is when we decided to support Set Sail Learn, the community opportunity for the fourth graders from the San Francisco Public Schools. It's the largest uh, single program we've ever supported, and literally thousands of kids are learning about science and math through the, the vehicle of sailing and they're getting to go on the water for the first time. You see these kids in the boats, they always dangle their arms off the side to touch the water. And th so those are the two things that I'm the most proud of. Paul, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between FAST and the foundation? We're so fortunate to have FAST here. It's the result of all kinds of good foundation work, but talk about the relationship. Well, um, basically it was the idea of Peter Stoneberg and Bill Chrysler to uh, uh, work with U.S. sailing powers to uh, basically bring up the idea. And then that idea uh, started gelling before actually fi uh, formal relationships uh, were made. And uh, Carol and I both sit in on an every other week conference call, and it's largely dominated by what's happening with the TISC lease and what it, does the memorandum of understanding look like between uh, the foundation and uh, FAST, the U.S. sailing, and uh, TISC? And all of those are, are moving along, uh, the least at a slower pace than, uh, than the other. But we have this MOU going, and really it's uh, – I don't know if I'm specifically answering your question, but it's because of the trust uh, between the people I'd mentioned earlier to say this is something we definitely want to do, and it's better than anything that U.S. sailing and U.S. Olympic sailing has done before. Also, I have to toss in Malcolm Page's name because he's an Australian with two Olympic gold medals who was brought on to upgrade our program, and he saw the opportunity here, and he's here for the long run. And he's he not moved, so he moved to the Bay Area. He moved to the Bay Area. He lives in Alameda. He commutes by bicycle or boat. And uh, we haven't seen as much of FAST this time of year. But uh, this in the, they were, they're in Miami right now with all of the Olympic classes. We're going to have some NACRA events here that we mentioned last week that Pam Healy's involved with. Then everybody goes to Europe for the big uh, spring regattas in Europe. And then all summer when the wind is strong, we'll be seeing a lot of activity on the bay. Uh, last year we had some wonderful laser downwind opportunities because they sailed out from, from Tisk in a big ebb under the bridge into the big swells. Tisk and being the Treasure Island, Treasure Island Sailing, Sailing Center. Center. It's, you know, six miles that way. And then they had to try to get home. Uh, in, a, in a big ebb, uh, capsizing like crazy in conditions that they'd never had before. And the uh, laser team made giant strides in that. And that's what we expect more of uh, when the program gets going. I'll just add a little bit. So FAST 
is so much more than just the U.S. Olympic sailing effort. Uh, having the Olympic sailing effort come here has kick-started this whole thing. But having it over at Treasure Island Sailing Center uh, has the elite athletes interacting with less elite athletes and with kids that are even in boats for the first time. And it's really designed to uh, be a high-performance training center for Olympians and non-Olympians and just to get the West Coast kids more represented in these, these elite sports. And even if U.S. Sailing leaves the picture at some point, they will have been instrumental in helping us kickstart this whole thing. And uh, so it's really neat having a partnership with TISC, who does all these com community things. And uh, it's, it's fun. And really, the legal parts are really a partnership between TISC and the St. Francis Sailing Foundation so that we can, we're not living and dying by the whims of U.S. Sailing. So, Paul, five and a half years from now and the 2024 Olympics, a brand new sport will be added to the Olympic sailing adventure. Would you tell everybody about the um, introduction of foiling kiteboards to the Olympics? It's a work in progress. It's, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the bay here and this club developed racing kites uh, a decade ago. And uh, we've, that was picked up and uh, around the world, uh, others have learned from what we've done. And now it is a worldwide sport. It was uh, temporarily in the, in the uh, 2012 Olympics, no, 2016, yeah. Uh, and then it was undone and windsurfing was put back in, uh, much to the chagrin of uh, the kiters in the Bay Area here. Um, but the, uh, they're still working on the format. And the dilemma with the formats is that the Olympics want every sport to have the winner of the last race win the gold medal, which is good for TV. Hold the excitement to the end. Yeah, and that's what TV wants. And then they also want an arena sport where they're in a small enclosed area where they can see the winner of the last race win the gold medal. Sailing does not fit that model. And so sailing has been trying to adjust to that under the pressure of the uh, staying in the Olympics. But it's more like golf, where the drama mm. increases over days and conditions matter. And uh, you may only be looking at the last day at who gets second from third. Uh, but that's... That's the challenge, and the Olympic people see kiting as something that's visually spectacular, and, oh, uh, they're hydrofoiling, and let's have them jump over barriers and run the high hurdles in the middle of the race, and who knows what else. And uh, it's, a, it's a very long story, but I'll just say the format is not fully established yet, but there is no woman in the world even close to Daniela in any of these five and conditions. a half year, five years out five years out they'll be working on it but just as an aside when um, when uh, kiting was going to be put in the olympics uh, for that six month period of time uh, my kids went to the uh, worlds in in uh, this was uh, Cagliari uh, uh, um, Sardinia and they were they were fortunate enough to both win when all of the world's coaches from windsurfing were coming to see what kiting was all about. And there were cameras on them at every turn, and there were coach boats everywhere, and there were 45 women and 150 men in those fleets, uh, which was much bigger than anything that had been seen before or after. So now this decision uh, to put kiting in the Olympics will change things again. The hydrofoils are new. The what we call ram air foil kites are new since then. And the performance has increased dramatically. So they do have to figure out a format where there's room for the kites and room for the speed uh, and still have pla passing lanes if they want to have this happen. W speak about the venue. I don't, uh, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, oh, it's in, yeah, that's in France, but, but 
it's all dependent upon what they try to do with this arena situation. Oh, what do you want to answer? Um, so, what are the, Carolyn, when it comes to raising bucks, which is the principal job of the foundation, um, the average Joe might say, gee, it's kind of an elite sport. Aren't you sure we shouldn't spend money on cancer research or something? You who've asked so effectively and over such a long period of time, how do you rebut that comment and say, no, this is very important? How is um, you know, the foundation good for the lives of young people who you support? I think everyone who's a sailor uh, can attest to the fact that being involved in the sport uh, really teaches you a lot of lessons that are uh, important to you throughout your whole life. And this is, uh, the lower you are on the uh, socioeconomic scale, I think even the more important those lessons are. So that's why it was so uh, exciting for us to get involved with Set Sail Learn with these fourth graders and provide opportunities for them to continue uh, sailing should they choose to do so. And with the more elite sailors, there's a whole different set of life lessons that they're learning. So um, it it's goes way beyond whether or not you're going to get a medal at the Olympics. So across the country, Carolyn, talk what other foundation, what other yacht club has a foundation like this? And are, what other sailing foundations um, do you see and admire that are doing a mission similar to ours? With all modesty, I will say <laughs> that I think we are the largest and the most important foundation of this kind in the United States. Uh, many, uh, yeah. um, there are uh, several yacht clubs in the Bay Area that have foundations, particularly the San Francisco Yacht Club and the Richmond Yacht Club. They largely are supporting uh, their own junior programs which of course we support the, the junior program here, but we go way beyond that. Um, the New York Yacht Club Foundation really uh, is a, a channel for some of the US sailing fundraising. I, I think we're, we're kind of unique. Uh, some other foundations have attempted to emulate some of the things that we do. But at the moment we stand alone and we're hoping that FAST uh, is a novel thing that's going to help us to continue to be at the top of the heap. But we'd love nothing more than lots of other foundations to get involved and for us to all join forces uh, to uh, keep this, this sport popular. It looked like about half of the, what's the male, female, and the recipient side uh, spread? What, do you keep a conscious eye of that? Are you thinking to yourself, I want as many women getting money, females as males? Do you think about that? We've never really kept those numbers, uh, and we largely uh, respond to grant requests that come in. Uh, certainly at the elite levels, um, it, it's 50-50. It might even be more, more women. And there's more and more young girls that are getting involved in a lot of these clinics that we're putting on or helping to get more girls. Uh, Pam Healing has been really instrumental in this and some of the clinics that US Sailing does, our, our West Coast girls have not attained the level where they would qualify and we've been able to talk our way into getting them to be able to participate and we're hoping as the years go by we'll be leading the pack in everything. Paul, can you talk about the uh, sort of beginner sailing activities supported by the foundation and give us some metrics around the, the kind of kids and the numbers and so on? Uh, let me just actually correct Carolyn because I just went through on my hand and almost all of our Olympians last go around were women. Uh, okay, we, had, we, had, we had Caleb, Helena. but then we, we had Brianna Helena. in the 470, we had Marion in the, in, the, in the windsurfer, and we had Helena Scott in the 49er FX. We and Paige, Paige Raley, so it was four, uh, out, of four out of five were, were women. Uh -huh. So, uh, so the, the men, how did that happen? I don't know. The men better <laughs> step up, you know. Um, uh, but uh, long overdue, and it's it's great to be adding ladies, women to the sport. Yeah, to, the sport. I, to, to answer your your first question about getting kids going, I mean we have a junior sailing program here at the uh, club, and we offer scholarships to YMCA kids to come do that. And that's uh, something, again, that we're, uh, we like to do for our community. Treasure Island has learned to sail programs going all the time. And we used to 
ba basically be providing grant money to TISC in general for that. But because we became the primary funder of, of Set Sail Learn, they're using other donations basically to, uh, uh, to do their Learn to Sail stuff. Then uh, Alameda Community Sailing Center and uh, Richmond are also doing Learn to Sail as well, and we support them. So that's the, uh, that's the status right now. I think there's, with a bay like this, we always have to say, why, why isn't it covered with Opti's right now? And uh, we always right. have to be looking for how to, how to get more kids out. So as you know, we broadcast this luncheon on a live Facebook live stream, and um, monitoring that, Julia is monitoring that. Julia, what do we hear from the stream? We have a question. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Uh, please tell Paul, thank you for the great explanation of kites and foils in the Olympics. Hopefully this will put an end to the ongoing debate of whether kiting is sailing or not. <laughs> I, I but it's from Joe Cool. <laughs> well, th this argument goes way back, and in 2012, uh, my son won the Rolex Yachtsman of the Year Award, o and he won every, th he not only won every event that year, he almost won every race that year. And, and so all of the people that, that vote on that award had to first decide if kiting was yachting in order to give him that. So they did come to that conclusion in 2012. Going back probably 20 years earlier, I was asked uh, by the, the, the St. Francis Yacht Club to see how we could get all the windsurfers to join the club. And, and so we went through all sorts of machinations about how to change definitions. And finally, we decided that, you know, if we just call a windsurfer a yacht, then they can join like anybody else. So. We had, we had done that 20 years earlier. So this is a work in progress. We're getting there. Uh, but then I'm, I'm speaking too long, but I have to quote my son at his Rolex uh, uh, acceptance. acceptance when he said, kiting is the purest form of yachting. <laughs> it, is, it is the only one where the power of the wind comes through the kite directly to your body to the board and the fins going through the water and over the waves. It is pure sailing. <laughs> End of story. <laughs> so Carolyn, uh, what other countries look strong, back to the, the Olympic level, what other countries look strong in the given events? And this is for either one of you. So who in, ki in kiteboarding, who's strong, Paul? French? The French are good. Uh, it's, it's really too early to tell. Um, mm -hmm. th there's, th but it's mostly been the French and the Americans. What about uh, the Brits? Uh, in kiting, no. Not in kiting, but in oh, sailing. Oh, Brits are good in everything else. Brits, the Brits, the Aussies, the Kiwis, uh, uh, in some, to some degree, the Dutch have been really, really good and have excellent teams. And if you just look at the Miami results coming in this week, just look at the flags on the left. Uh, uh, on the scorecard, and you'll see the strong teams. So uh, talk a little bit about what's happening in Miami. Most people don't know. In fact, um, I just talked to Malcolm yesterday from Miami, and he was uh, quite enthusiastic about how our team is doing then there. Talk about the event. As, uh, Ron, you may know more than I do. I've been... Uh, our U.S. Olympic team is competing down in Miami right now, and yeah. Malcolm buzzed yesterday to kind of say to me that the team looked real strong. He's quite happy. For those who are not remembering, Malcolm Page was a two-time gold medalist, seven-time world champion, has spoken at this podium a couple times in the last couple of years, and he went from being coach of the Australian team, where they beat the bigger American uh, population team, uh, 7X, uh, and uh, to become our uh, chief of U.S. Olympic sailing. And that's an incredibly bold and strong move by the U.S. Olympic sailing team to pick Malcolm. And he's a very, very thoughtful leader, very rigorous, of course, in his methodology, and he's pretty encouraged. Nobody who's really good ever gets encouraged ahead of a competition, but he's uh, got steady confidence, I think is the way I would describe how he was just talking to me on the subject. 
basically, I've been doing Yacht Club emails at midnight and haven't gotten to Scuttlebutt to look at the results. So I'll fix that tonight. So you could talk about one other thing, though. This is the last time for a class that's been an incredible hallmark of the Olympics, and that is the fin. You were a fin sailor. Can you talk a little bit about the feelings that, um, you know, I could be asking Henry Ford about the, you know, advent of self-driving cars, and he invented the Model T. How do you feel about the fact that the fin is going away and you were a fin sailor? Really, that question it resolves around what do you think Olympic sailing should be about? Okay, and so your and, answer would be? And, and I've, you know, I sailed a fin for far too long, uh, didn't weigh enough, uh, but uh, it was, it's, a, it's a poor man's star boat, and as Bill Chrysler said, it's a way of uh, sailing uh, single-handed without a crew in a boat that sails like a bigger boat. By fewer it, lunches? Yeah, by, by fewer lunches, and, <laughs> and I went back to a to a uh, master's event in uh, Miami. I hadn't sailed a fin in 20 years, and it was so amazing to have a boat I could actually put my lunch in. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so I, I mean, th th the fin is a, is a remarkable machine, and it, since they opened up pumping, it's become a real athletic contest, so that the, the guys who are pumping hardest and are in the best shape uh, they're like cross-country runners. They're really, really powerful. So you have to give up something to get something. And we're, we've moved toward high performance in the Olympics. We've moved more toward uh, gymnastics, uh, some people would say. And now they've put a long-distance race in, uh, a, a double-handed, uh, mixed-gender long-distance race, which I think is a cool model. And maybe what the Olympics should do is do something different you know, every four or eight years so things don't get locked in and think they're going to be there forever. Uh, fins could come back, starboats could come back if something else went away, and it might encourage those classes every now and then. Uh, you know, to, not that they need encouragement. I mean, the 505 is so happy it's not an Olympic class because it's been able to progress on its own all these years and not get stuck with the, the Olympic baggage that the 49er has. So, Carolyn, you, you've been very successful as president of the foundation, raising bucks uh, constantly. Give us a quick snapshot of the organization of an auction. You've got the auctioneers that you mentioned. You've got MC Paul and, and Casino are going to do a great job being MC and auctioneer this year. But below that, you have honorary chairs and then functional chairs. And then talk about this like incredible army that I've seen you amass year after year and what they do. What is their job? So, uh, so the key elements for success are to have really great auction items. Uh, we, we try to have things that are nautical, that, are, that money can't buy. Like our foundation back um, in 2010, I believe, we offered the very first rides on an AC-45 uh, when those uh, boats came along. So a day on the Maltese Falcon. We yes, we a day on the Maltese Falcon. I happened to be a winner of that. Uh, it was really exciting. Uh, so getting those items, not just your stock item that you could get at any school auction, that's a big part of it. And then you need to get people to come to the auction to bid on these things. And in recent years, we've been looking for sponsorships and patrons and advertisers and, and that type of thing. And uh, aside from, from those key things is just the, all the mechanics of put to get, putting together a fun event so that everybody will have a good time. It, it looks to me like it's a 10-month activity level, a year That's long, about it. Ten it, months it as soon as you get through uh, raising the glass to the celebration, the success of one auction, you're figuring out who's going to chair the next <laughs> one. But it's, uh, it's a great thing. I think it's fun and profitable and promotes the sport, so we like that. And one little thing I'd like to break the news on today. Perfect. Uh, Paul had mentioned that back in 2008, the Olympic team came here for a big kickoff on their way to Beijing. And in 2020, we are going to have a party here with the whole Olympic team to kick off on their way to Japan. And it's going to be awesome. Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> Good going. Terrific. Paul, you had a comment you wanted to make? Perfect. Great. Thank you, Carolyn. Yes, 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 yes. Thank so, you, Malcolm Page. <laughs> so so uh, Commodore Paul Heineken and five-time president 
of the St. Francis Sailing Foundation. Carolyn Patrick, it's great to have you here at the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Live from our St. Francis Yacob and live, and also thank you to Bill Chrysler, the current uh, president of the foundation who works tirelessly on this and who called in from Los Angeles on a business assignment. And with that, the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon is adjourned. Thank you. Great, Carolyn. Thanks for joining in. It was fine.